And now we're opening up the floor to our corporate vibrato of giving back and how a great company can go into nonprofit activities. And for this, I want to welcome CEO of Ableton, Gerhard Behles. Hello, Gerhard. Thanks for being here today. Hello, Anna. Great pleasure. And uh, so we don't forget all of our world changers and tech events are based on the sustainable development goals. And in this case, we were looking at quality education, that's SCG4, SCG8, decent work and economic growth, um, SCG11, sustainable cities and communities, as well as SCG17, partnership for the goals. So if you don't know your SCGs yet, you can go ahead and Google them or go to our YouTube where we have various different SDGs that we always try to target in our events. Uh, so we make sure that we're also giving back in all of our talks that we have. So having started this introduction, again, Gehad, thanks for joining us. And since we have this really great mesh of like an intersection of um, entrepreneurs that are coming from our community, as well as those that are interested in nonprofit activities, and I hope uh, people from your own industry, from the music industry, why don't we go ahead and tell those that might not be familiar with music gadgets, what Ableton is doing and how you started it about 21 years ago. Sure. So, Gerhard, uh, my name is Gerhard. I have been uh, dealing with music forever. How I got into doing what we're doing now is through music and basically my, I guess, very early exposure to music as a teenager where I have encountered electronic music and just fallen in love with the sound of it and been wanting to know just how is that possible? How is that kind of sound being made? And that really drew me in. And I think uh, I have been incredibly fortunate in meeting along sort of my journey, people who have been guiding me in the right way early on. So for example, as a teenager, when I have uh, discovered electronic sound, I wanted to know how it's made and I found a teacher at a local community college. And from there on through multiple stages of meeting the right people and having the right guidance i was lucky to come to a place where founding a company seemed like a possibility and the way it came together the inspiration for it really was from our own practice like we wanted to we were making music this is in the 90s so we are talking uh you know berlin uh clubs in squats, types of situations, techno, uh, electronic music, um, but also academic music played a role due to our background simply. And we just, uh, through our own musical practice, developed a wish for something that didn't exist. It was like, why isn't this piece of software there? That it's like an obvious need. So we quite simply made a thing that we wanted. And that's how we got into it. So that's the basic, uh, basic uh, backdrop of the beginnings of it. What we then made is a piece of software that's called Ableton Live. And it's a, it's a software program for your Mac or PC that you can use to compose, produce, perform your own music. And it still is the stronghold of what we do. Even so now we do many other things. So that means you guys were DJing at the clubs in Berlin. Is this? Not exactly DJing but touring, playing shows. And because I don't play any instruments, I'm really not musical, I guess, very much at all. I was always quite reliant on the computer and technology for it. But at the time, that was a possibility. And so we explored it. Okay. And so um, at what point, now that you've, now this has been 21 years that you've been with Ableton, how, how has your company grown? within these last two decades almost? It's grown quite organically. So we had a pretty constant growth and is now somewhere around, I think we're pushing 500 employees in several uh, locations in the world. And it's also grown quite organically in terms of audience. Music is slow. In many ways, the business of music instruments is a slow business. 
because people have to adopt an instrument and they know, like if they've ever laid their hands on a violin or something, that it will take time before you are good at it. And it is no different with technological musical instruments. For people to get really good at what they're doing and become like natural with, with the instrument, be it a piece of software or a piece of hardware, they know they have to invest themselves. And therefore you need to build trust with your community that you're going to stick around and that you will be there for them and not you know, abandon ship and that you're consistent. And I think uh, therefore staying, in, staying true to our values over 20 years has helped build an, organ an, an organic following and uh, uh, a now very large community of music makers. Do you know how large your community is? Because when I was doing my research, that's like one thing that stuck to me because I was talking to friends that use your products and they're just saying how great it is. It's very intuitive and that you do a lot of things with the community. And, and, and there was a mention of you do like a music festival as well. We used to be doing a big uh, music, not a festival. It's a, it was a summit for music makers. I'm saying it was because we couldn't do it now. It was called Loop and it was like a huge gathering of uh, music makers, basically people coming together to talk about the art of making their own music. And uh, this was a very inspiring place to be and a wonderful time. And because of COVID, obviously, it wasn't possible to do this time. Mm -hmm. And so, we, so we're looking at, you guys have, you know, great organic growth. I mean, you're one of the household staples or studio staples, I called it, in, in the music industry. So at what point did you feel a settled enough to start thinking about nonprofit activities? So at what point does, is there a shift where you can say, oh, this is something that we need to do? Or has this always just been part of the, the company culture and mission? It's a deep question because I think the idea of, so we're doing this thing and it's for profit. And then we're also doing something on the side that's not for profit. This is never somehow clicked for us. You know, like here's, here's your company and then it has its CSR arm on the side and it's doing mm -hmm. something, something else that's good for your conscience or something. That's not how we, how we ever thought about it. We thought about it really from the beginning uh, as in, we want to contribute something to music making and music makers, that's the goal. And I think we, of course, in the first years were entirely focused on just building a company and making it sustainable and making it work. And had like, I wrote, I wrote code. So this was not anywhere in our, I guess, thinking. But I think then through the years, more and more the idea became uh, important and also received more, simply more time, management time, that uh, we want to come to a place where the company is set up also beyond our own tenure and even beyond our own lifetime to serve its purpose and nothing else. So the whole idea that really it's there to make profits and the profits can go to the shareholders and that's what it's about, right? And then, well, it has to do something to make that happen, should go away. And instead it should be more like the company is there to serve its purpose, period. And that's what it does. And the whole profit motif should go away. Now, this is of course a rather different idea of company than what we're traditionally used to. And it also is a different idea of company than how we were set up initially. So we are dealing with a transformation that has like major legal consequences and uh, of course very complicated financial consequences because you know it's a large company now it has shareholders all of this is there and exists and so we are we are dealing with this and are in the process of uh, reconfiguring the company towards uh, an outlook like this but I cannot report on uh, something that's like done and, and concluded I can just say that that's in that's where we are at and that's what that's the journey that we have so that's, uh, so, yeah. that's, so that's the, the, the vision that you're going towards, and maybe that's why it's a perfect time to talk to you about these 
nonprofit activities. And but maybe if we go to um, we minimize it down a little bit. To what's the first nonprofit activity that you guys decided to actively pursue, and how did you set it up? And so I guess that was kind of the first part of the question: is at what point were you guys like actively saying this is a project that we want to set up, and what was it? I can tell you that uh, that was a uh, this was based on a uh, on an incident. I want to say so. In uh, the in the process of growing uh, our audience, we also tapped into a sub audience of educators, people who teach about music making by way of using our tools. So in, this, in the concrete, there's like a, a teacher somewhere in, in uh, South California, and their mission is to teach kids who otherwise are basically lost out to music education, it's not gonna happen for them, how to make their own music. And that's the, that's the way he found to capture their attention. Like, why don't you make music like the music you actually want to listen to, as opposed to you know, making music that people wrote a couple hundred years ago and they're long dead. And, and so we tapped into this uh, audience and started to engage with them and talk to these teachers. And I actually remember vividly one day attending a class where like this teacher, Lawrence Gray, um, was teaching a class to like, I mean, basically kids with not a lot of privilege at all. And uh, he could totally light the fire in them. And it was fascinating to see how within 45 minutes, every, everybody was, you know, everybody had a piece of music made and was so proud and so excited and fired up about, you know, like learning is a thing that's actually worthwhile. It's fun. I can make something. I don't only have to take in, I can make something. So I was hugely inspired by the experience. And what then happened, uh, because, Okay, so we have to explain, we not only make software, we also make a hardware product. This is a physical instrument, it's called push. It's like a piece of gear that you connect to your computer and it basically is everything you need to make a piece of music. It's really, a, it's a wonderful piece of hardware. And this, for this teacher, was very important in the way of teaching his uh, students. Of course, because if you can use your hands already you are much closer to your intuition. And it was a much more, I guess, inviting way for him to teach music. So we saw all of a sudden, even though it was never intended, there's this huge potential for this piece of hardware that we made in education. And we thought, how might we better support education through this? And then uh, we developed a program where when a second generation of this product was introduced, we gave the owners of the first generation an opportunity to turn in the unit that they already had so that we could donate it to schools. And this okay. way, this way uh, collected many, many, many thousand pieces of this musical instrument and we distributed them to schools worldwide. And we don't know for sure how many students we were able to touch this way, but this must be easily 50,000 or something. So it was, uh, it was a great success. You could see how the demand was there and we could not meet it. And of course, the guy is thinking, how can we you know, go to the next step? How can we make that a permanent thing? How can we institutionalize this? And then that got us straight on a path of thinking about, okay, this is not probably something you would do from a traditional business point of view at all. This is something you're doing because you believe it's good for people. But I really want to capture um, um, that part of the activity because there's so much hardware out there and we're talking about circular economy and being able to kind of recycle things. So I think for anyone that's looking into maybe from an entrepreneurship perspective, if you know that maybe one day you can also cycle your items back to help educate, that's, that's a really great thing. So, um, and, and then the next step, did you guys, in order to start this project, for anyone that's going through a thought of nonprofit, did you hire someone 
directly outside or is it, it something you guys first did as a team and did it just stay within your team mm -hmm. or did it become its own entity at some point to do these nonprofit activities in a focused manner? Uh, let's get there in just a second, just to quickly close the bracket on the hardware topic, because what you're saying, uh, of course, resonates hugely with us. We have, we have a big concern around making at mass scale, like many, many, many thousand pieces of very complicated electronics every year. So there's a big environmental impact to this activity. We've, we've gone to the pains of calculating the CO2 out of every single piece. We know it, we compensate for everything, but we know that that's not good enough and that we need to, we need to become much better at basically managing this whole life cycle of the hardware units. And of course, the idea of recycling it via education is wonderful and helps a lot, but it's really one piece in the puzzle. And I can only, to those uh, in the audience who ponder over making something that involves physical products, um, I can tell you this is complicated beyond expectation. Managing uh, a hardware manufacture logistics cycle in a sustainable way is a big, big task. So I just want to close that bracket to turn to your question. Uh, we have not yet um, in any organizational way forked off a nonprofit from a profit for profit activity. We probably will have to do that. And I'm saying we will have to because by the nature of what we actually want and how we feel about things, we don't want to do it we feel like the whole the whole of Ableton should be committed to purpose. And sometimes that may involve uh, a, a commercial transaction and sometimes not. But it would be really wonderful if we could get to a place where we could embed this thinking with every single employee rather than having it sort of outsourced in some way or compartmentalized in some way. But the actual fact of the matter is, it's looking like we will have to establish a foundation and things like this. But that has more to do with how the, I guess, external uh, legal, et cetera, conditions require us to do things so that we can do what we want to do. Now, looking at the longevity of your company and being CEO for such a long time, um, what is it about I guess what I'm hearing out is like investing in the people that you see the benefits from in, in these last you know, years that you've been at Ableton. Like what are the benefits you see by, like I said, investing in your, <laughs> in, in the own company and its people? They are immeasurable. I mean, we have been so lucky to have, as I said, like a pretty organic growth development. So we haven't had the, pains of going through higher and fire waves. Like here's your next round of layoffs and then you somehow get back on your feet and you start hiring again. We never had any of this. We really were able to quite consistently grow, but also rather, I mean, by, by I guess, uh, valley standards or something, rather slow. So we were able to bring people in by and large work with them for a long, long, long time and accept that it takes a long time before they get it. Mm -hmm. Because what we make in many ways is strange and odd and you know, it's, it's a strange field. If you're making digital musical instruments, you are somehow bridging a gap between an industry that's ultra slow, ultra conservative and high tech where you have to respond and you, you want to think agile and so on. And you are forcing people to position themselves in some weird middle ground between mm -hmm. these worlds. That's not always easy. So we can really, really use sort of the standard off the shelf textbook kind of knowledge about how to make a product or you now like here's your, here's your, uh, Design 101, that's how, it's, that's how it's done. 
none of this really works for us and we have to kind of do something else and something more bespoke. And that does require a lot of time for people to sink in and absorb this. And over, over time, I think it has proven effective. Is there, uh, if we look at, I mean, because it's, it's a remarkable, so Ableton is a remarkable company. I mean, as you're speaking, we can hear out, you know, like all the great things you guys have been able to do and that you're um, continuously, I kind of not just only giving back, but what, what are like the values of the company that you would say from your learning has made you guys so strong? Like, is there a certain company philosophy that people walk into or are there, you know, really five core things that <laughs> you look at that you feel like when people walk into a company, if those pillars stand, then that's going to make the company, you know, the company live longer. We have always refrained from making that sort of step to, okay, now let's write them down. Here are the values and put them on a poster on the wall for some, I guess, caution around maybe if we, once we write them down, they're dead or something. So I can't spell them out for you like this in, in, a, in a convenient form. I think what we find consistently very important is that uh, it's not about us. It's as simple as this. And I'm, I'm always trying to instill that in, in everybody who I work with. It's not about you or I, or it's not even about us. It's about, you know, in our case, the music makers. And somehow I feel there's, uh, there's a lot to be gotten out of that mantra. I mean, down to if uh, really people uh, accept as a calling something like, I want to contribute to people being their best creative versions that's what I want to do and I want to uh, put my best work in to support people in their creative endeavors then maybe it can take a little away of you know all the other things that of course are also important and valid in a person's life like what's my career going to look like you know what's my uh, how, how might I outcompete my colleague or something so somehow I feel to continuously shift the focus back out. We're not here to deal with our own stuff. We're here to deal with their stuff. I've always found helpful. Well, I think it's interesting that you said you don't put things that your philosophy down, like written down, because most of the time when you get your larger corporation, sometimes you get a handbook and you have like a company value or uh, you get indoctrinated into understanding a company's culture. So it's, in it's interesting to hear because maybe it's not necessarily the things people have to write down, but it's just doing the talk and people uh, are, are walking the talk, right? And, and people just kind of uh, being part of a very natural culture. Um, no, I think it's also like, as you, as you, I'm sure, have witnessed, oftentimes, as you come into an organization and you see the poster on the wall with the values on them, mm -hmm. you are becoming aware and alert of the mismatch between how it actually works, how it actually feels, what you actually sense from what's written. And that can be a good thing, but it can also be I guess creating even a sense of suspicion to begin with that I wouldn't want in the house. I would want, I guess, everybody to know that it's complicated. It's just complicated. I, it's not as easy as to say, here's the culture, got it? Because the culture is nothing you can simply write down or, you know, there's, there's not even a single truth about it. Like I'm, I have my version about what the culture is but my colleague next to me has a totally different version of it. Are they not entitled to theirs, you know? So I think there's also some, something about overbearing different people's perspectives that I'm not comfortable with in this. I, well, that's great because, well, before we go back to uh, uh, going to the nonprofit, because you're talking about, this sounds like to me also a way of leadership. Um, you called yourself in one interview, an unlikely CEO. If, if there's, what do you think makes a good CEO? 
I don't know if you remember this, but there was an interview where you actually quoted that you're a kind of an unlikely CEO because it wasn't something that you were looking to, to become, but as everything else grew organically, it's kind of what happened. But if you were to pinpoint, you know, what makes a good CEO, what would, what do you think? That's really hard to say because see, it's my first job. I have never worked anywhere else except university. So I really don't have a lot to compare with. I think maybe the, uh, the, I guess the requirements on the great CEO are also very different depending on the stage of the company. So I have found that throughout the stages from like an early startup to running a company of 500 or something people, the job really changes. You know, it's, it's a very different uh, approach towards the people you work with. I guess in a startup context, you're thinking of the people around you as people who help. They came to help you in doing what you need. Now, at this stage, it's a little more like I'm here to help them. So this is a very different dynamic. And you also have to ask yourself at every point on the, on the way, am I still feeling like I can do that? Mm -hmm. Am I still being in a good position to actually do, do this in support of, well, the music maker, ultimately? And it's, of course, a question that's very difficult to answer. So maybe the unlikeliness of my CEO-hood is in that I'm a doubter. I'm always very doubtful and uh, have lots of questions about, you know, inc things including myself and my own aptitude. So maybe that's something that um, I would, um, yeah, I don't know, single out as an oddity, maybe not a commonality. Most CEOs that I know are much more self-confident. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> Or overconfident. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, when I want to go back to the nonprofit part really quick because when when we were talking about education, that's one of the big things that you guys had gotten into in, in teaching children about music and giving back in that way. Are there other activities that you guys have also done besides that, where you kind of just uh, per incidents came upon it, or what other? products or things are you guys doing? Education is uh, maybe a part of something larger, which I might call learning or something. Mm -hmm. So learning maybe even still is a little too narrow. There's also inspiration and so on. We do uh, a lot of things in this space and uh, some of them are free, free to everybody. For example, we have a set of resources on the web that allow anybody to learn about the basics of music theory and now also the basics of music synthesis, sound synthesis in an interactive way in their own browser. So it could be, you know, like that can be on a mo that can be on an Android phone. Like you really don't need much anything at all based on these resources to acquire a solid basic understanding of what it takes to you know, navigate the space of making music. And I'm super proud of this because this is, of course, it's the web, so you get the numbers. This is turned on so many people mm -hmm. to basically overcoming the intimidation of, uh, oh, uh, this can't be for me. You know, this is for people much smarter than me, much more educated than me. And I think this is not a dedicated nonprofit or something activity. But I mean, it's free. So mm -hmm. we're happy that we can make it accessible to everybody. So would you say like underline, if someone came to you and said, look, Gerhard, I'm trying to do a nonprofit. Would you say education is key? Like, would you almost underline that anyone that wants to do something nonprofit and to give back, it's not necessarily about, you know, money handouts or doing this, but it's, it should be tied to, to educating. I mean, it's, obviously like one of maybe the one biggest lever that we've got in the world. I mean, the way I think about it often, we should all be thinking about what's the future for the world that we feel good about. Not always easy to do, but I think everybody should do that. And when I think about that, 
then I run up against like the big problem of of growth. Like as a as a society, we don't have enough planet to keep growing like we used to. So growth can't be about amassing more stuff. We need different notions of growth, different ideas about how people can develop because people want to develop. And I mean, sure, while we still were in a in a regime of your growth, your development is measured by your possessions, you had an easy way to correlate that to what's happening in your outside world. But that has to stop. We cannot keep going like this. Then how will we otherwise, you know, in, have a meaningful notion of, of growth that satisfies this deep, deep underlying need of humans. And mm -hmm. I can only think of things like, well, you, you know, think of growth in, in emotional, mental, spiritual ways. And creativity is such a huge, huge lever there. Like if we can, if we can turn people onto making stuff rather than buying stuff, and if they find a deeper dimension of their own, I guess, personality in it, and they, they can grow this way, then that's a future that I believe in. That's something I can, I can think could work. And then I just feel we need, to, we need to be a stepping stone towards their future. We need to make something that leads towards that, that is helpful towards that. And, you know, whether you can make that happen in the context of, you know, like a classroom as a teacher or as a parent or as an entrepreneur or as a leader of a nonprofit secondary, I just think that's a, that's somehow a vision that I really firmly believe in. And I think we're going back to uh, the vision that we kind of touched upon at the beginning that you were discussing how uh, your, your for-profit and non-profit are kind of going to merge together in terms of purpose. So what are, you know, the, the benefits that you then see coming out of you guys going to, you know, as you stated, you're going through some um, institutional transitional change within the company. What are the what are the goals for that? Like, why would you do that? You know, because I think this is a model that more companies are going to have to look at. So there must be benefits to it. Yes, let me try to sell that to everybody who's uh, listening in. I mean, maybe to cut it simple, what's the ways you can nowadays in a traditional economic understanding set up a company like you can make it a private company that's maybe family owned, and is also supposed to be passed on to members of your family. It's inherited, or you can make it a public company so its stocks are traded. And I think what we find missing is a third way, because in the first model, where it's like it's a, it's a family business, do I really want to burden my kid with having to run this company? Am I sure that this is the best possible person on the planet to fight for our purpose? I mean, that would seem like an, an odd chance, really, doesn't it? So we want to make sure that indefinitely, it's the best people that are most passionate, most capable that run the place. So that's one. Therefore, the dynastic solution is ruled out. Now, if we make it public, and it's like a traded company, something happens that I find potentially difficult when I'm really interested in preserving the purpose of the company, which is that the ownership becomes anonymous. People end up owning stock that have nothing to do with the business at all. They only understand through essentially financial transaction what's going on. And that again, I think has caused in some parts of the world some trouble. Like this dissociation of the responsibility about what the, what the business actually does from the power and the ownership seems wrong. So we need a third way. And I think the, a good model for the third way is also implemented and is happening in many parts of the world. Not unfortunately in Germany, we don't have anything that's like an off the shelf, like legal way to 
incorporate like this, but we really need it. For example, in Denmark, this is a very common way to run a company and many, many super successful Danish companies, including like, you know, like large beer companies and whatever are run this way. Mm -hmm. These are companies that basically cannot be sold to anybody. They will never lose control. They are indefinitely committed to their purpose. And they have a fantastic track record over hundreds of years. They're super crisis proof. Nobody meddles, messes with them from the outside. And that feels really attractive to us. Which is exactly, you know, we're, you know, being crisis proof, uh, crisis proof is what we've seen in, in times of Corona. I think companies are really having to look at, you know, the different various formats uh, that they can change from what you mentioned, traditional to new ways of running business. Um, and I think we're looking forward to hearing in the future how Ableton's going to transform. Um, I want to, before we come to the end of our great discussion on giving back on various levels, ask you two more questions. The one question question we had was from an entrepreneurship uh, question. How long did it take you to get your first prototype done? <laughs> hard, hard for me to remember uh, that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can tell you between founding the company and shipping a product, it was two years. And somewhere in between that, there was something that might have looked like a prototype. But I will also say 20 years ago, with the uh, was no established practice like you know the lean startup and mm -hmm. how you how you test your product early or anything like that and iterate quickly mm -mm. we didn't do any of it we just made the thing like we like we thought it should be and then we shipped it we didn't know if anybody would like it and how was the resonation was did everyone like it or did you have to actually then old school kind of go back and then change it and now looking back on it you're thinking oh we should have maybe tested it more we could have maybe gone lean or do you think your intuition was kind of right on it is a difficult de a debate because you can't know this but i think there's see these are polls and there's no there's no no side is right you need to navigate the space. I am concerned that if you are always always asking too many questions on your user, you are never educating your user, and that's wrong. Companies are there to also put a stance out, like this is how we think it should be, and maybe it's not how you thought it should be, or maybe that's not how that's maybe not what you resonate with immediately. But we think you should give it a little try or something, and I think somehow that role of the company is leading, not following, tends to get lost in mm -hmm. a lot of lean uh, and, and uh, agile approaches. Also a great statement. So I'm gonna give you one more question that you get to think about while I, I do a round out to the, the audience. Um, think about what is your most favorite tech gadget that you, th I mean, obviously maybe besides your own that you came out with, but maybe before that, what was a music tech gadget that you, would say really inspired you uh, in your youth or even, even it could be something from the past or it could be something now. But I'll give you a minute to think about that um, while I give the audience uh, a big thank you for being part and you guys can make sure that you sign up to our newsletter for any other further events we might be doing. We'll be having one in September with Field Belt. They have a haptic device for VR, music, and gaming. That should be interesting. Um, so with that, Gerhard, what do you think is the number one music tech gadget that inspired uh -huh. you? Okay, I would, I'll pick one that unfortunately isn't available to anybody, including myself at this point, I think. Oh. When I got to the Institute of Sonology in the Netherlands, as a student in 1989 or something, there was a PDP-11 computer. That's a mainframe. And it could do a thing that just blew my mind, which was called granular synthesis, because somebody was there called Barry Truex, and he wrote the program. The guy wasn't there anymore. He had long left, but the program was still there, and it was magic. You could do something that sounded like rain or like thunderstorm, and was not like any synthesizer you ever tried before. I thought it was so cool because it was like this, this remained 
of the presence of the person who wrote the program and left. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your insights, Gerhard. And we're looking forward to now that we know more about uh, where Ableton is and where you guys are going in terms of merging, you know, the for-profit and non-profit and giving back also to your employees and maintaining a great culture that you guys have. Um, thanks for being part and we'll get to see you soon again. And uh, to everyone else, we hope you guys have a great day. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Anna. Cheers. Cheers.